So in addition to talking about various management situations, stuff, we'll also talk about as the semester goes on some different examples of other communities ecosystems that have uh, uh, interesting management challenges. So the first one we'll talk about here is Antarctica. So this is the view out of my um, cabin from the bow of the boat that I used to go down on. Antarctica, so it's our seventh continent. It is, unlike the North Pole, the South Pole is a land mass, right? And we have this ice extending beyond the, the terrestrial side of things out into the ocean. In the North Pole, it's literally just frozen seawater. So you can, run, as we have, you can run a submarine underneath the North Pole. You can't do that in Antarctica. Antarctica is an amazing place, really, really cool, unlike virtually everywhere else on the planet. Here is an illustration of the terrestrial landmass. It really is uh, an apostrophe, if you will, with the tip of the apostrophe pointing up towards uh, South America, towards Tierra del Fuego. And you'll see there's some shallower areas, especially in these two bays, uh, uh, Ross and McMurdo and, and those areas. There's some shallow areas. There's some deeper areas. Um, really interesting place. We have different oceanographic climatological processes that happen in, in Antarctica. Most important one being uh, the fact that if we look back at this image, this is the, there's only one place on Earth where you can start out at one latitude, stick your finger on the globe, for example, and spin the globe on its axis, and not encounter land, a landmass. Uh, that place, with the exception, actually not, not even the exception, the only place is right here, right between the tip of South America and the tip of the so-called Antarctic Peninsula. Everywhere else, you're going to eventually hit a continent, hit a big island, something like that. And so as we've talked about in the context of wind moving around and how we have different, uh, different heat, different thermal masses on land versus on the sea, that's going to mean this is the only place that if you can imagine we were spinning the globe with our finger, we wouldn't hit any land. So if we were wind molecule, if we were air molecules blowing around in the wind, it'd be the only place where there'd be no way of breaking up that wind. It would just keep building and building and building. So this circulatory air mass um, helps create the so-called Antarctic circumpolar current and in effect creates the shallow ocean water, lower atmosphere cutting off of Antarctica from, um, to, to a decent extent from the rest of the planet. And so that is this, that is this it, it, it varies, it moves up and down, it varies a bit, but that's the convergence, right, which, which meanders up and down, but it basically is between the tip of South America and the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. If we look at, more on that in a second, but if we look at the, the location of Antarctica, it's the only place where we don't have, where, where, where some country isn't in control of the whole thing. Um, there are some folks that, that claim ownership. We're going to run out of time to talk about that today, but we'll talk about it next time. But we do have, is we do have various bases. These are countries' territorial um, um, holdings. So these are just like an embassy. So we have an embassy in Moscow. The Russians have an embassy in DC. The Italians have, have, an, have, a, have a consulate in Los Angeles, et cetera. Those areas are considered Italian territory or Russian territory, right? I mean, they're in the US, but we, we consider them, it's like you're going to Russia or Italy or whatever. Same thing with these bases. So while the US doesn't claim territory in you know, a large swath of territory, it still has a, a toehold. These are the major bases in Antarctica. These are research bases, although these all or almost all have in their origins the Cold War. 
So the Cold War was a place where we could go and project power. In the case of Antarctica, it was partly projecting military power, but it was more done so through science. So we're going to send our scientists down there, and they're going to study the penguins better than your scientists, right? That kind of thing. So what you see is you saw all these countries um, started with the U.S., Great Britain, uh, and, uh, and, the, and Russia, and New Zealand, and Australia, because they're just they're close by. And then you eventually see all the, a lot of these other countries start to burble in. What I'm showing you here are the per, in red are the permanent U.S. bases, or excuse me, the permanent Antarctica research bases. These refer to the bases that are operating year-round, 24-7. So we, the U.S., operates three permanent Antarctic bases. We have uh, Abinson Scott Station, which is at the South Pole. That's primarily atmospheric research, climatological research. Uh, also some astronomy, some, some, uh, some arrays melted into the, the, uh, the ice. Uh, McMurdo, which is our largest U.S. permanent station, this is... Uh, a large base, there's a decent amount of marine biology and other things that are done there. And then the smallest US base, permanently operated US base, which is Palmer Station. That's the one that I used to work out of. So this is basically almost exclusively marine biology, uh, life sciences research. Um, to give you, a, I don't have the most recent numbers in my head, but to give you a rough estimate of how many people these stations get populated with folks in, in the austral summer, and then they go to a vastly reduced staff in the austral winter when it's really, really dark and cold and massive storms and you can't go outside because you'll freeze to death kind of thing. So as a, as a rough estimate, um, McMurdo can hold a lot, uh, over a thousand people. Uh, Amundsen Scott, a lot on the order of maybe up to 200 people. Palmer Peak is probably about 50 people. Then other countries have their bases. And then we have so-called seasonal uh, outposts, seasonal stations. So that might be a spike camp to study penguins that, that only is, and those really only operate in the austral summertime. So our winter, their summer. Uh, and that would be maybe a camp that, or a little station that, that goes into effect for say two months. And then, and then it's broken down at the end of the season and, and come back. Um, <clears throat> Originally, to get to our bases, you had to be transported there by the U.S. military. So by, by airplane, if, if we're talking about here, or by uh, uh, ship, by ocean-going ship to Palmer and McMurdo. Uh, since, since the end of the Cold War, these, these areas have been converted to civ entirely civilian control. And so the National Science Foundation is the entity in the U.S. that, that funds these bases and the operation of these bases. They, have, they put a contract out every, every decade or so for a, a supplier, for, for an operator. And so the scientists go down here and do work. You guys could go down here and do work. But then there's staff that get paid a regular wage, the cooks, the mechanics, making sure the generators are running, that type of, that, those type of janitors, those types of folks. Those folks are actually a, contract, uh, a contractor of the US government. But again, no longer the military. It is the civilian government. The only thing the military does now, if there's an emergency, they can, they can fly in supplies if needed sometimes. Sometimes it's so cold you can't get there. But the other one, the most famous uh, example of this is we take an icebreaker down and we break through this at the start of the season with an icebreaker to cut the channel to so boats can get into McMurdo. And that's technically the Coast Guard. But outside of that, there's no routine military support for the U.S. bases. Uh, uh, one of the most, uh, so then uh, the UK through the British Antarctic Survey have several um, famous uh, well-known bases. Um, they also have one, some up on South George Island. <clears throat> and then uh, the most famous Russian base, which is Vostok, which has the coldest temperature ever reported on the surface of the earth um, in the air uh, that happened there. I believe it was minus 239 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's cold. It's cold. What's the average temperature? Of it depends. It depends. I mean, it could be like 70 degrees if it's in the sun and it's summertime. I mean, it's... It, I've been in that. In their summer, I know they're 
Yeah, yeah it can be. Time. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally. So we're running out of time today, but uh, just as, as a bit of a wet your whistle till next time, I'll just say that um, we have a thing called the Antarctic Treaty. More on this next time. But uh, the treaty basically says we shall not, we shall not uh, you know, divvy up the continent and turn into another colonial fight for resources, et cetera. Um, most of the signatories of the Antarctic Treaty don't claim territory. Again, many of them have bases. We have our bases. But you know, a base is like campus here. You know, it's, not, not, it's not a massive holding or whatever. So here I'm referring to people that actually claim ter land territory. And so what we see here is seven countries. Claim, OK, so here's the, the South Pole. And then we're looking at different swaths, right? So New Zealand makes a claim, uh, Australia makes a claim, the French have a claim, uh, Argentina has a claim, all this, uh, all this and that. And so they're making these claims not because they want to go live there, but because they think there might be, for example, future, future mineral uh, extraction that we, could, that we could benefit from. So they're trying to claim that. So one time when I was there, I'm getting old, I can't remember. I think it was Argentinian. So one of the Argentinian bases, they had this, this officer <coughs> whose wife was pregnant, threw on a C-130, flew her down to their military base, landed her there. She was like eight and a half months pregnant. And, and she was there for a, a couple days and then gave birth to her baby there, right? So they're like, hey man, it's our territory. We got babies being born here, right? You know, that kind of thing. There's a lot of geopolitics that goes on and has gone on in Antarctica. And again, that's gonna have implications for our management of this location. So we'll, a couple, one or two more slides and then we'll stop for today. So again, as I mentioned before, there's this, there's this cutting off of the core area around Antarctica and then the area nearby. And it creates different, uh, different conditions. So for example, in the Antarctic zone proper, underneath that convergence, south of that convergence, that's where we see the sea ice floating sea ice. It's generally not very, uh, very um, uh, illuminated. Um, surface water is pretty cold, lots of nitrate, low iron. Iron is a key limiting nutrient in some of these, some of these uh, uh, oceanic areas that, that is, is another key limiter on productivity of things like phytoplankton, etc. cetera. Uh, then we have the area just above that which has strong westerly winds, relatively high light, relatively warm waters, lots of uh, nitrate there. This is what that looks like. So this is, uh, when I used to go down, we, this is, I'm old, so we used to go down before we had uh, all kinds of fancy instrumentation. Once, a couple times a day, we get a satellite printout of the weather, right, the, the, the most recent uh, photograph of the atmosphere. And so I stole some of these because I'm a nerd and I would save these. Everybody else would use them for like tic-tac-toe and stuff, but I would save them. So this is one of these images. And what you see is superimposed. So, so the continent of Antarctica is superimposed on here. And then what you're looking at is atmospheric or, or clouds, right? And so check it out. It's just, so the, the tip up there, that's the tip of South America. And you have these just you know, raging winds, raging winds. Here's another one where you see this sort of curling storm just burbling out. Very, very high seas. So we would go out of, so, so if you go to uh, the South Pole, you usually fly in. If you go to McMurdo, you usually come in from Christchurch, New Zealand. That's where we launch the boats. In the case of Palmer, we go out of um, Punta Arenas, Chile, which is just near, um, just north of Tierra del Fuego. So we come out of the Straits of Magellan, and then we go straight south. And so we go right through this area. So this is, these are the craziest seas in the world, the most intense uh, storms. So this is a very, very mild day. And um, you know, easy seas, waves that are 40 feet high um, and, and sometimes a lot bigger, super crazy. Um, this is a picture uh, from uh, what the bridge looks like. At night, um, there's all these icebergs, so you gotta, you gotta have these big, powerful spotlights on these icebergs to make sure you're not, you're not uh, gonna run into them. But uh, as an example of the management challenge here, and then we're gonna end on this. Uh, one night I remember going up, 
into the bridge and listened to him, and there was these guys screaming on the radio. So they were a tanker. They were a Philippine-flagged tanker, and they were sinking. And so they were calling. They were desperately. It's nighttime. There's a storm. Uh, not like not, it didn't, it, there was like sort of snow blowing. It's hard to see. And these guys were screaming for help. And so they're saying, please, please, please help. Please, please, please help. And then we were listening. It was the Argentine Navy was or Coast Guard. I can't remember one, one of them. They, they were talking to them and they were saying, like, where are you? And they're saying, oh, my God, we're flooding. The, 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 the ship is is breaking apart. Help us, help us, help us. And the guys kept saying, OK, where are you? Where are you? Didn't know where they were. Dark out, can't see the stars, can't you know, get a, at least even a relative fix from that. Um, and then over the course, very, very sad, very, very scary thing. Over the course of a couple hours, they're getting more and more desperate. Oh my God, oh my God. And it's, and it's freezing cold water out, right? You can't just jump, you, you have the other thing called Gumby suits, survival suits, but they only give you another you know, few hours, kind of a, a, in an ideal situation. And so these guys couldn't, figure out where they were. And then they started saying, oh, the, 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 uh, the engine room, the engines died, so we're on battery power. And then when you go on battery power and the engines die, you can't, you want to point your boat into the, into the waves, into the wind, so you are stable. So when you can't, when you lose control of that, you might get broadsided by a wave and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And they say, come help us, come help us. And then finally it goes to just silence, right? And they basically all died. And no boat's gone. Boat broke up, sank. No, nobody ever found the, the ship. So that's what this place is like. I think sometimes we're used to our modern society where we're connected, where we, we can you know, get a pizza, we jump on what is, who married who on Wikipedia and all that kind of jazz. This is not that place. This is not that place. So one time, there's more people now, but one time when I was there, we did a back of the envelope calculation and for the whole of Antarctica, we estimated at peak, peak summertime, peak all these people and everything, maybe 5,000 people, maybe 5,000 people in the whole of the continent. You're talking like the lower 48 states kind of mass of, of an area. So it's a crazy cool place. It's really cool. It's really neat. We'll talk about it more next time. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Going down.